All right. Okay. So I think it's been a good amount of time. Uh, I'll leave it up. So Harleen is our fantastic intern at Career Development. Um, and just for those that don't know myself and Gia, we are the Career Development Department at Macaulay. I'm the Career Program Coordinator. And if Gia, you want to just say hi, and then I will pass it off to Harleen. Hi, how is everyone? My name is Giannina Crispin. I'm the Associate Director of Career Development at Macaulay Honors College. I'm so, so glad um, to see so many of you join us today, and I hope that you benefit um, from the wonderful knowledge that our panelists will pass along to you. Awesome. Arlene, take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming today at our event. Um, my name is Harleen. Just for you guys to know, I'm the career development intern here at the Macaulay Career Development Office. Um, a little bit about me. I am a junior. I am a Macaulay student at the Baruch campus. So if you see me around Baruch, well, right now because everything's virtually, but in the future when all, when all is well, if you see me, wave hi. I'm more than willing to talk to everyone. Uh, that being said, uh, we thank you all for coming today at our event. Um, our industry talk is a replacement for a career fair where in the past we've had multiple industries, uh, multiple employers from industries come in and really meet students. But we found that industry talks provides a more intimate and a rich experience for every student. So you can personally connect with employers from a specific industry and more importantly, learn about their experiences and really have a more in-depth conversation with them. Uh, so our event will start off with a panel discussion. I'll be asking our employers several questions about who they are, their role, their experiences, and then that'll go on for about an hour. And then afterwards, we'll break out into uh, in breakout rooms. And at that time, you can ask any question you want. It can range from opportunities. Uh, at, you can ask about anything about questions, any uh, about opportunities that we've emailed you about. Um, any career advice, experiences, really this is all, you can ask any question where it's open to anything, it's up to you what you wanna ask. And we ask that during your, when you're in the breakout room, you stay in your breakout room and we'll be rotating the panelists for you. So all you have to do is sit there and really connect with employers. All right, that being said, we also wanna uh, request that you all hold your questions to the breakout rooms just so we can have everything move, move smoothly and so we can easily go along with the event as smooth as possible. And that being said, I've, I think I've talked long enough. It's about time we've uh, introduced our panelists. So that being said, um, I'm gonna kind of direct to each, which panelists we're gonna talk to first, just so we, it's more clear and more organized. So Dimitri, why don't, why don't we start with you? And this goes for any panelists right now. Please tell us about yourself, introduce yourself, your role, where you work, and a little bit about your position. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> hi everyone, thank you for joining. My name is Dimitri Kucher. I actually was a Macaulay student at Baruch College, graduated in 2011. I started my career in risk management, Citigroup in a rotational program, then moved on to EY where I was a consultant for four years. Now, I, then I moved over to another kind of more uh, mid-sized consulting firm called uh, BDO, um, where I'm a manager for the past year. I, I focus on a model validation and valuation of complex financial instruments, um, nice boring uh, um, items that are complex, um, they're unique, um, and <clears throat> sorry, my collective career over the past, you look at my LinkedIn, I, I had to sit down one day and count, there's probably 15 different uh, projects, roles, um, and it also helps that I'm a CFA, a chartered financial analyst, so that you know, it helps kind of the common thread throughout all my roles. So I'll definitely speak more about it um, later on, but I'll move on and let others introduce themselves. Great, uh, Dow, if you like, you can introduce yourself right now. Sure, hello everybody, my name is Dow Kim. I went to Baruch Macaulay and graduated in 2016, so not too long ago. And I started out my career in a renewable energy solar startup but um, I guess I really broke into the financial industry when I went through the finance management analyst program at Bank of America. And after rotating through a couple of different roles in that program, uh, I graduated from that and I jumped over to the sales and trading business within the same company, Bank of America. And I've been in this um, equity, synthetics and securities lending structuring desk for about a year now. Um, 
And it's been quite an interesting year so far, but in my current role, we mainly look at um, equity swaps, futures, and uh, we also look at different ways we could optimize trading structures with our clients, uh, our clients mainly being hedge funds and, and asset managers. And we, we find ways where we could bring value to the firm, but also to the clients. And it's very vague, but part of my job is pretty vague. So I, sometimes I spend a lot of my time reading up on different um, structures or regulations or trading strategies or uh, what's going on in the market. Um, so it varies quite day to day, but that's where I, I am now. So talk more later on that. Sounds great. Uh, Jamila, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Harleen. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jamila Smith, and I'm one of the campus recruiters at Bloomberg. Um, I graduated from Baruch in 2013, um, and I started my career um, as a campus recruiter um, at a professional services firm. Um, I was there for about three and a half years and then um, made the transition to Bloomberg. My role consists of partnering with target schools such as Macaulay Honors and the CUNY system for entry level talent for our full time and internship roles in the areas of finance, customer service and data analytics. Um, one, fact, one fun fact about me is that I'm also currently serving in the US Army Reserves. Um, I've been serving for the past 17, a little over 17 years now and I'm currently a Sergeant First Class. Um, so really excited to be here with everyone tonight. That's great. Uh, Jeff, you want to introduce yourself? Of course. Sure thing. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. I see we have a lot of Baruch representation on this call, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, I also graduated from Baruch College um, in 2014. Um, I intern at the place where I work um, in 2012 and 2013 in Sachs. I joined full-time in 2014. And uh, um, I joined into a reporting and analytics role. And then after two years of doing that, I went up to my manager and said, hey, look, I have to do something different because I cannot stay in front of the screen all day. I need to be out and in front of students. And so he kindly helped facilitate my transition into campus recruiting. So I've been doing campus recruiting for the past four years. Um, and my remit has brought in to do um, recruiting across the, the firm, across different levels. So I've been doing that holistically for about five years. So in total, my time at the firm has been six years. Um, similar to all of the other panelists, super excited to be here with you all today and share some thoughts. So welcome. All right, thank you. And last but certainly not least, Steven. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Um, checking in tonight and I do have some things that are similar to the other panelists. So as I talk here, you'll be like, oh, okay. Um, the first, first off, um, my career at Goldman Sachs started after I completed um, Baruch College. So I'm very similar to most of you people, but they didn't have the Macaulay Honors Program back then. They called it a different program, it was called Baruch School. So that's what I was um, working through. In reference to Goldman Sachs, I worked there 23, 24 years, which it might be as old as all you people are <laughs> on general average number. Um, so if you think it's like a long time that you've been living and everything, the, the days are long, but the years fly by. Um, the wonderful financial crisis came along in that 2008, 2009, and my li little library card expired there. So then I had, had to move on to another place. And now I've been at Namora, and I've been there for about 10 years. My role at Goldman was um, initially with treasury operating and monies, and then just making sure I had a Metro card to, so I could be able to go home. Although now you don't really need a Metro card to go anywhere. <laughs> um, from there, I, I moved into the futures area, handling um, clients' accounts for futures. I actually went out and visited the clients and met with the clients and handled a lot of the report and things like that. So it was a good career over there. Um, when the Moore was building out the business in um, 29, 2009 and, and 2010, 
they were adding people. They originally only had around 500 people. Now we have almost 2,500 people in New York. So when other people were laying people off, we were hiring people. So there would be Steve from Goldman, this other person from Merrill, this other person from Deutsche Bank, this person from UBS. So basically it was like an all-star team. We had the best from all different places. And you can catch up with me later on. Um, definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn, even if you're not in one of the groups later on. I'll talk to you guys soon. All right, sounds great. So now that we have all the introductions out of the way, um, let's really get into what your day, your typical day at your job looks like, just so we get like a feel of what you guys do and what your role really consists of. So uh, if we have any volunteers who wants to start. Um, I can start, Carleen. Now, do you want this pre-COVID or <laughs> during COVID? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do both for comparisons. Okay. Um, so pre-COVID, um, because I'm on the campus recruiting team, I'm sure Jeffrey can attest to this as well. Um, our schedule is cyclical. So during the fall recruiting season and the spring, I'm typically traveling extensively to various target schools, hosting different events, sitting on panels such as this one, going to career fairs. Um, trying to build a pipeline of candidates for our roles. Um, in addition to that, um, my day-to-day -day consists of reviewing resumes, uh, reviewing what we call pre-recorded video interviews, which is what our first round interviews are, and also designing strategies for the businesses that I'm currently recruiting for. So really outlining um, what profile of candidates that I need to look for as I go to these events as well. So that's from September about uh, November time frame, take a break during the holidays, and then we're back on campus from the end of January till about March. Um, from around April until August is our internship season, um, and we're really focused on building up our internship pipeline, planning the internship program, and running it completely for the company. Um, so that's typically what a day-to-day -day is like. During COVID, now everything's virtual. So um, it's, we're essentially doing the same things, but everything is virtual. So I'm still reviewing resumes, still doing different types of events virtually, um, having phone interviews with candidates as well, um, and then also um, planning strategy meetings with, with our businesses to determine what their needs are for 2021. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Yeah, this is Dimitri. I'll jump in quickly. So um, as some of you may have learned in your corporate finance classes in terms of structures of companies, you have horizontal uh, structures, you have vertical, in terms of the teams, and then you have um, matrix. Um, so the consulting answer that you guys may experience over your careers in different um, roles that you are is the answer, it depends. So you know, that is the kind of work that I work on. It, on the hourly basis, sometimes it actually changes. Um, given that I work in consulting, I'm more on a teams-based um, uh, matrix organization. So it, it's from manager up, in, in a lot of cases in BDO, we have kind of um, a pers uh, permanent one. I'm kind of in model validation and any weird out of the blue complex financial instruments that need to be valued. So that comes to me, but it's we have a pool of younger um, associates and senior associates who help out as in terms of if they have availability and in terms of their expertise. So my day-to-day -day pre COVID was going to the office, um, meeting with clients. Actually, I was, I was, when I was at EY, I was a hundred percent at the client site, but with BDO, with the kind of valuation work I do, we can do it from the office. So pre COVID, it was a lot of meetings with my managing director, everything in person. So after COVID, I don't want to scare folks, but with the time that I saved from not having to um, commute, I've actually been working more um, given, you know, this kind of environment. So the hours could be weird. It depends on who's available. Happy hours now are just Zoom calls, just like this, where everyone brings their own alcohol, but we're not going to, you know, a bar um, until they reopen, I guess. So, um, yeah, I, 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 will, I, I can easily speak for hours on any of these topics. So I, I just want to stop it there, say, you know, get you guys used to consultants like me who say it depends well, me personally, I don't like I don't want I don't like to be mean when I say that, but it really it does depend. There's a lot of variables in play. So 
to try to give an answer in 45 to 90 seconds is very difficult. So I'll stop it there and let others jump in. All right, uh, Stephen, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, my day to day now, you know, I also lost out on my wonderful commute of an hour, an hour and a half. So now, um, pre COVID, basically, um, the idea is to get into the office. And, and what I'm doing now is called regulatory reporting. So I have to tell the regulators everything about all the money um, that are held for, for the clients' accounts for futures. And I have to um, work on a number of Excel spreadsheets and get data from different parts of the world, from Chicago, from overseas, London, Paris, Hong Kong, Tokyo, all the different areas. And I accumulate all the information together and I have to send a report in by noon every single day. And if we miss that cutoff of noon, we get fined a thousand dollars, but it's not just a thousand dollars. It's your reputation. And then probably the auditors, no offense to auditors, but they, they'd come swarming in to see what's going on, you know, why we can't our reporting on time. Um, a lot of the information I, um, gather is specific to futures and options on futures so it's different than when people are trading stock when people put money in the bank in the bank you're protected with the fdic so everything's fine with that with stock there's something called sipic sipc but with futures there's no insurance at this point so they really want to keep an eye on all the money that you deposit to make sure it's going to be available and someone doesn't steal it there's a lot of scandals out there. So when you, you become a multimillionaire, make sure you give me a call. I'll give you some warnings of what not to do. All right, thank you. Um, Jeff or Doug, either one of you can take it away. I can go next. Um, so I'll walk you guys through a typical day before COVID happened. So um, the sales and trading Floors are pretty, you know, active and, and pretty fast paced. And at the same time, they revolve uh, around the market hours. And depending on what product you're working with, you know, whether it's equities or commodities, interest rate products, it might vary slightly. But um, where I am, I'll get in around 730, uh, which is a little bit earlier than my previous jobs, but I kind of prefer getting in a little earlier. And I'll start my day by logging into Bloomberg and reading all the news and kind of getting up to date with everything that's going on. And then looking at the emails and then kind of from that point on, it's kind of very ad hoc. So it depends if, you know, some of the traders or salespeople have questions for my team specifically, they'll come by throughout the day because it's very open floor layout and say, hey, we have this question from a client, can you help us with this structure? They're wondering about this or that, and we'll kind of work with them to figure out what's going on there. And at the same time, I we have kind of projects that we're working on at the same time. So for example, like these projects can vary really you know, widely, and that's going back to you know how vague my team is a little bit. And I, I think that's a bit more unique to my uh, team specifically, but one day I'll be working on a project uh, looking at you know, Canadian futures markets and how the prices are trading and, and kind of why and looking into, <laughs> kind of looking into why they might be priced that way from the hedge funds perspective or, or things like that. Or maybe I'm looking at how to automate, you know, using Python on my current desk where, you know, we might have some more manual processes. So using different skill sets to um, help, help add value to the team. So it, it really does, uh, vary throughout the day, but um, speaking on behalf for some of the other people, it, it's usually a bit more structured, like the sales and trading people. Um, the sales people are kind of constantly on, on the calls with clients. Traders are constantly booking trades and managing their risk and, and watching out for, you know, what's going on in the market. So uh, my team's a little bit different. And then post-COVID, um, working from home, similar scenario, but just a lot less people walking by to ask us questions. So um, both are the same. Sounds good. Jeff? Yeah, thanks. I, I won't take you through too many of the details because I think Jamila hit the nail on the head with regard to campus recruiting. Um, I'd say pre-COVID, I was definitely legitimately in office every single day. 
Um, and especially from a, a campus recruiting perspective, we learned maybe in April that we would have a fully virtual program. So we had to learn how to hold a virtual program um, in a short period of time. Um, and so we were our internship from 10 weeks to five weeks. And uh, we rolled out a number of platforms to help support us during the internship to make sure interns still felt like they were getting a productive experience, albeit virtual. And so I think I spent a lot of my time pre-programmed just trying to get that up to speed. And then now we are focused on how are we recruiting next year's summer class? Um, and so working closely with the business to understand where are their growth opportunities um, where do we want to look for for talent and what type of talent are we looking for? What type of backgrounds are we looking for um, as well? And so I love my role because I get to play an active role and really help build out offices. Um, and we say it all the time, especially at Goldman, that people are really our number one asset, right? Human capital is very important to our firm. While we make millions upon millions of dollars, in book, we hire people one by one. And that is intentional and that is deliberate. And so, uh, so that's a little bit about how my role has looked over the past six months. Hard to believe it's only been six. That's great. And then while we're on the topic of the whole pandemic, I think it's really important to address that with all that's going on in the recent uh, pandemic, um, a lot of students are impacted by unexpected turn of events where they lost an internship or they've had suspension or even the, the switch from going to from being in person to virtual so that being said I think a lot of us are really seeking the advice on how did you navigate your career and deal with any unexpected obstacles or challenges that you may have faced so is there anyone who wants to go first or or has an answer So this is Dimitri, I can, I, I can jump in on that. Well, honestly, well, you know, some of us, I, I got lucky, I graduated in 2011. So it's kind of in this, in this weird kind of looking back, you know, the crisis 2007 to 2009, and now, and we had some dips in, in the middle of the two, uh, you know, I, I forget if it was 2012, 13, but you know, there's, there's flows and it's unfortunate um, to be graduating or to, to look for internships in this kind of environment. Um, and, but at the end of the day, um, I was, um, Stephen mentioned the, on regulatory reporting. I started my career actually in 2013, in, after two years in, in the management group, um, program at Citigroup, I was working on CCAR, which is the capital, uh, Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review. In short, it's that big scary stress test that the Federal Reserve did on an annual basis. They failed Citigroup twice in three years, so second time in 2014. That hit me the hardest because I was studying for the CFA um, and out of nowhere, my workload doubled overnight because if you want to use a finance term, I had a beta of 1.5 to CCAR. That was my, that was my role. I was doing on a daily, I was doing it on a, uh, what you call, on a manual basis and I was also automating it with, with, with the, all of the software folks. So when I was hit with that, it was not pre pleasant. It was not fun to now have to shift my goals of CFA for another year because I was studying and out of nowhere I have much more work, right? So you, you have to be flexible. You have to have conversations like this where you are looking for, you know, you have questions, you have an open mind, you're doing your research, you're, you're relying on expertise of folks around you. Um, you're going to need to do some more leg work, unfortunately, now than, for example, when I was in your shoes. Um, and that's the reality, it's unfortunate. Um, but at the end of the day, don't dwell on what happened in the past. Um, use it as a learning opportunity to move forward. Um, and participate in events like this, um, networking with folks after the meeting, you know, take down our information, reach out to us on LinkedIn. A, a lot of us, again, I can't speak for everyone, I don't wanna speak for everyone, but at least me, I've been uh, involved with Macaulay, with Baruch for the past decade. Um, and always look, looking forward to answer questions. But at the end of the day, you need to roll with the punches. You need to, you know, it's not a pleasant um, message. And I wouldn't even know how, 
how you know these how Jeff and, and uh, Jamila did these virtual internships because when I was doing internships, me being in the office, learning from from um, my, my fellow coworkers, um, analysts, associates, the DPs, that was crucial to my learning. So it's a new environment. Um, I don't know if anyone could have, besides Bill Gates a few years ago, I don't know if anyone could have really predicted this um, to this extent. So um, that's what I Sounds good. Um, I'll give you a little intro into me. When I was in college at Baruch, um, I, through the career placement center, I was able to get a, a position um, basically helping an accountant um, do, that goes out and audits most different clients. So I was working in the Empire State Building, which I haven't seen in about seven months or so, <laughs> um, because I haven't been in the city in around seven months. Um, I was able to, to learn what, what he was doing, but at that point, I realized I didn't really want to work for you know multiple companies. I wanted to you know focus more on one particular company, and you know th that drove me to get an opportunity. I worked a, a summer internship at a company called DLJ, which is now part of Credit Suisse. Then from there, I went on to a place called Swiss Bank Corporation, which is now part of UBS. Um, when I was doing that position, I was handling funds trading and the settlements of trades and you know fun things like that. Um, it was a great opportunity there. And then my boss there tells me, Steve, why don't you go apply, instead of staying at Swiss Bank, why don't you go to Goldman Sachs? I'm like, what, me? I'm like, I'm like 21 years old. I'm not gonna be taking a job or anything. No, I coach a soccer team <clears throat> and the other soccer coach um, works over at Goldman Sachs and at that point they were looking for people because they didn't have like Pentium chips or anything to put into the computers so um, there was a need for more bodies uh, and they were hiring many people so after seven interviews at Goldman Sachs finally someone said yes we'll, we'll take you <clears throat> so everyone thinks everything's gonna be like a staircase and everything's gonna be planned out but it all depends on who you meet and you know who you um, talk to and, and interact with. And, you know, the key thing is always keep everything open. I used to tell people that, you know, if you have your resume, and you're taking a subway or a bus or something, keep it out with you. If someone looks nicely dressed or not nicely dressed or, you know, just say hello to people. But now things are a little bit different now. So there's many ways to reach out um, to people, especially through LinkedIn and other methods. And I just want to take two seconds to thank Jamila for her service to the country. Uh, I also do something called uh, mentoring for ACP, uh, American Corporate Partners. So I had like five different wonderful um, Army and Marine people that I helped in, in reference to their career. But thank you again. Thank you, Stephen. I was actually an ACP mentee myself. It's a, it's a wonderful program. Good deal. I can go next real quick. Um, similar to Steve and um, my career trajectory wasn't very linear as well. So I actually uh, stumbled on to the uh, internship role for Bank of America through a random Baruch career fair that I was at actually. And honestly, when I first went in there, I don't know if you guys have been into any of these career fairs, but they're massive and there's hundreds if not thousands of students and it, it seems so hopeless. And honestly, I wasn't really going to stand out. And especially at these bigger companies, they have these massive lines. And I was not trying to wait an hour or two just to maybe talk to someone. Um, or that was my mindset at the time. And eventually, I talked to some of the shorter lines and shorter companies, I guess. And, and I was there until they closed up. I was, I was pretty disappointed in, in kind of the results and, and, and how I felt at the end of the day. But then as I was walking out while everyone's cleaning up, Bank of America happened to have their booth and they were cleaning up and there was no one there because you know it's closing time. So I was that guy that was like, okay, hey, what's the worst that can happen? Let me be there and try to grab someone last minute. And I did that. And <laughs> honestly, I thought the lady that I spoke with, I thought she hated my guts because you know she was kind of talking over me and instructing people to clean this up and move that and make sure you, you know, pick that up. And, during my pitch, which was, you know, kind of horrifying, but turns out later on, once I joined the bank, we turned out um, to develop like a really good relationship. And she told me that she was actually, you know, impressed with my pitch or whatever you want to call it. And 
Um, basically that, you know, last minute decision to jump on that career fair line or non-existent line really kind of changed the, my entire course of my career. And ever since then, I've had four different roles at Bank of America so far, mainly in, you know, in part due to the rotational aspect of the program that I joined. But what I really liked about it and how I had to navigate that program was I had to really up my networking. So I had to go out and, you know, network to figure out what team I want to go on next, et cetera, et cetera, for, you know, years and years. And by the time I graduated the program, you know, it was kind of second nature a little bit, you know, it was kind of, you know, the next thing you got to do. And once I finished the program, I actually ended up getting my current role um, on the structuring desk from a cold coffee chat, you know, from, you know, my company. So I sent a quick email to an associate, you know, grabbed coffee with her. She told me about the role and the team. I thought it fit really well. She introduced me to a couple other people on her team. Next thing you know, I'm interviewing with the managing directors and a month or two goes later. And then uh, they eventually gave me the offer for my current role. But the entire, you know, four, four years I've been um, working, it's basically been like that, just constantly networking. And that's, that's uh, been how I have, that's how I've been navigating my career so far. And then post COVID, of course, it's really hard because, you know, now that aspect is a bit muted, but uh, we find ways to try to, you know, improvise and, and, and uh, meet people other, other ways, you know, whether it's Zoom calls or um, just, you know, having to schedule more phone calls rather than, you know, going to um, people and kind of striking up a conversation at a happy hour or something, because once you start working, happy hours are a really great place to network with people internally, um, but those are gone for now. So that's what I've been up to. And yeah, that's it. If I can add something very quickly on the coattails of both Steve's and, and Dow's um, conversations, I, my career trajectory, if, if you know, on LinkedIn, it may look like very prepared or, or very scheduled and, and that I had everything planned ahead of time. I interned at, at, at uh, Jamil, actually, I interned at Bloomberg LP somewhere between my uh, freshman and sophomore year in the accounts receivables department was my first role. I got that role weirdly by just talking to a friend of mine who told me about this program called Ladders for Leaders. It was, you know, I don't know if it's still around, but, you know, that was 13, 14 years ago. Went through that program, got that role. Um, if you remember, 2008, 2009 wasn't the most pleasant time. Um, so I had this uh, Starker Development Center profile set up and I had my resume up. I was just applying um, here and there um, where I was able to. And I saw TD Bank. They literally had no rolls up. It just said TD Bank. Some, I, I, it, I don't even know if they had a description, but of course I knew what TD Bank was. Click, click, you know, send my resume across. What, you know, to, to echo what Dow state, um, Dow's statement, what did I have to lose, right? And then, you know, I, I got a call. I, I was at, I was the business manager of the ticker. It's a fancy way of saying the treasurer of the ticker. Um, I remember during that summer and uh, during that fall semester, they call me and say, hey, Dimitri, you got information. Are you, internship, are you interested in a risk management internship um, at TD Bank? And I said, of course I am. Put down the phone. I was sitting, standing over next to the business editor at the ticker. And I looked at him and I said, Manuel, what? what uh, you know, I, I want to watch you know, I said, what in the world is risk management and you know so you know ultimately got successful there um and with Citigroup, which was my seminal internship which ultimately started my career it was a black box they didn't even um have um they didn't have on-campus recruiting i was going through the you know, recruitment uh, part of their website and definitely with other firms i just submitted my application and you know, um, did all the necessary things, and then got the inter uh, interview. For me, the moment my mentality was, okay, I have to, you know, work hard to get the in interview. But the moment I have the interview, there's nothing I have left to prove. Now I'm on the same um, uh, what you call level as everyone else. Now I need to do very well at the, at the internship. But once I get the um, intern, uh, the interview. Now I need to prove myself. I don't need to worry about how I got there, you know, whether or not Baruch is a core school, you know, Q 
CUNY versus NYU versus Columbia, you know, all these conversations. We all went through this. We, we, you know, we know the, the challenges that you guys are going through. So, you know, keep hustling and you never know, honestly, click, click, click. And nowadays it's even more online because that was in 2009. If I was clicking a lot in 2009, I can only imagine how much I'm clicking um, now. But you never know, numbers, numbers, numbers. You just keep applying, keep applying. You only need one yes. And if you want a choice, you can have two yeses. But you don't, need, it doesn't matter how many, it doesn't matter the ratio of yeses to noes. It's you need to get a yes in the field that you want to work in. And then, and then you kind of take it from there. And don't, please don't try to plan your career. You have to be open-minded and you can, you know, it's really hard. I, I said I have an eclectic career. I haven't even given an overview of what model validation or complex financial instruments. You know, that's going to take a while to, um, um, I don't want to bore everyone, but, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't happy at EY. I was, it, it wasn't a secret that, you know, there was a chance that, you know, if the right opportunity came around, but I didn't have a, I didn't have a diary that said, all right, you know, summer of 2009, I need to apply for BDO as a manager. No, you know, it came a, a, um, a, about organically punches and you can't really predict the future. If we can all predict the future, I think we're in the wrong um, roles. I do want to just add on quickly that, um, you know, in addition to all that's been said, practically there are a ton of programs available for you all that are at your disposal, right? So, I mean, I was a part of America Needs You, which some of you may know, you know, two year career development program for first generation college students. There's MLT, there's SEO, there's T. Howard Foundation. There are a ton of clubs on campus, including clubs like NABA and Alpha that will give you exposure to professional experience and also as a shameless plug at Goldman Sachs, because Harleen, you mentioned students not being afforded the opportunity to intern. Um, at Goldman Sachs, we've rolled out this virtual undergrad immersion experience for students who have um, lost their internships. So if you're interested in still gaining real world experience or real internship experience, then you can apply to this program. Um, and it's available on our website. So if you're interested, head over um, and, and check that out. But there are a ton of programs still at your disposal. So please don't feel discouraged because you've lost an internship or because your internship was shortened. There are a ton of companies who are still willing to give you exposure to what it's like to work um, in, in corporate or whatever industry you're interested in. You just gotta search. Thank you so much. I think this has all been really uplifting. I really think this has uplifted everyone's spirits just by hearing everyone's advice based on, on what to do with challenges and all that stuff, your trajectories. Um, so moving forward, uh, let's, I want to touch a bit on skill sets and resources. So what do you think are the most common skill sets that are really necessary to have when you want to enter a career in the industry? Or what resources should students really approach or you utilize the most at this time? I could jump in on that one. I think the first thing really is communication. Um, whether or not you realize that, you know, the different speech classes that you took, things like that, where you stand up in front of the class and present whatever topic you're talking about, that really, you know, pushes you forward because that's what you're going to have to do. Whether it's, you know, presenting to your boss or to your coworker, or to the managing director, there's always going to be a challenge for you to go up there and, and actually communicate whatever it is. And a lot of times if it's a meeting, the best bet is always to try to get buy-in from people beforehand. That way during the meeting, you'll have two or three other people say, yeah, that definitely makes sense. You don't want to just start the meeting at the meeting. You really want to start the meeting before the meeting. Yeah, and I can also chime in. So for our entry level financial um, programs, one of the best practices that I tell students is um, having a good sense of what's going on in the markets, right? So following Bloomberg, shameless plug, um, you know, maybe, you know, using the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, so always keeping up with what's going on in the markets and seeing impacting clients worldwide. So whether you're going for a Goldman or a Bloomberg or Bank of America, how is what's going on in the markets impacting the clients and knowing how to speak to that? Yeah, I, I definitely want to also echo what Stephen said about communication skills. 
Um, going back to the story of where I was at the career fair, I didn't really have any financial experience before the internship. So what I really had was pitching my soft skills, quote unquote. And I literally just pitched that I had soft skills uh, and a you know, variety of other random experiences that I've accumulated throughout the college career. Um, so I, I highly recommend that. And, and also, you know, I think during your early part of your career and also in school, um, try to maximize your presentation opportunities because you only get so many in, in a real world setting. Um, so I, I had an idea a little bit earlier on and decided to take a minor in communication studies so that I had a bit more extra presentation opportunities to the practice. Um, and then eventually, you know, when I joined the firm, I, I try to take up as many presentation opportunities as possible, whether it's, you know, teaching uh, various, you know, um, tools or, um, you know, giving presentations for whatever is part of my program and things like that, but really putting in the effort to get the most value out of it so that you could improve and, and keep getting better. Um, and then on the flip side of it, on the technical skills, if, if it applies to whatever industry you're going into, uh, what really stood out for me was uh, a bit more on the technical side. So learning, starting off with VBA, um, kind of how to make macros in Excel and automate some simple tasks for my team that really helped me stand out among my peers in my program. And then eventually, you know, utilizing those skills, building on them, you know, learning about databases, SQL, finance, everyone works with data. So that also helped me stand out a bit more. And then Eventually, as I started kind of being the, you know, technical guy, uh, people would come to me with questions about how to automate things or VBA or programming and things like that. And eventually, I, I continued learning and uh, learned Python on the side. And it ended up being one of the deciding factors of how I got my current role, because on my current team, no one knows how to code in Python. And there was uh, quite a demand for it on my team. So uh, they said that definitely helped me with my chances. So if, if that fits into your industry, uh, I definitely recommend uh, those skills as well. If I can jump in, I wanna say one thing. The skill of being humble and not claiming or trying to claim that you know everything. Unless you are the Watson supercomputer, you have to be comfortable saying, there are ways of saying I don't know without actually even saying those words. I'll get back to you, uh, you know, uh, uh, giving a high level answer and then getting into the details later on. I'm always put on the spot, unfortunately. Um, and I really just a couple hours ago had a very, could have been a contentious call between PwC, myself and my client where they were trying to reconcile. And right at, to Stephen's point, I had my managing directors back where I said, look, I need, I'm gonna politely ask for five minutes just to get everyone on the same page because we're all speaking different, similar, uh, uh, we're trying to say the same thing, but we're all kind of speaking different um, things right now, different languages. So, you know, I asked him, can you please, you know, if someone really jumps in and, and, and tries to hijack th that five minutes, because I mentioned something about them, it would throw off um, everyone getting on the same page. Um, so, you know, having that backing was very helpful. And I just wanted to, you guys know that you don't really know how someone really thinks until you meet up with them uh, later on. And to Dow's point, I actually, one of my intern uh, interviews with Citigroup, this is, what are they, I think they're called Super Days. I had four interviews in two hours. And I go to this uh, managing director. He's, you know, it's imposing. It's in Citigroup. They have these tables and, you know, sit down. He just has a pad of paper on. And I don't remember, I think it was the second or third question he asked me. He just takes his pen, which is a gel pen, and I'm getting, and I'm saying these details on purpose. It's not superfluous information, but he just draws an XY coordinate. And if you know what these gel pens, he just kind of dots a random structure. Uh, I think it was a parabola or something like that. And he asks me, what's Y in terms of X? And I'm looking at that. It wasn't really perfectly shaped. So, you know, all these formulas are going through my head. And then I say, you know, um, I don't know the exact um, I think at that point, that was 2021, I did say, I don't know. But I said, I don't know the exact formula for that. But because I have Abaruch and hopefully it's still around, I took what's considered stat three. So you have statistics, intro to statistics, 
You have uh, financial kind of metrics, which is econ 4000. And then you have uh, financial econ metrics, which is econ 451. So I have a more of a statistical bent. Um, so I said, well, I'm gonna, I would take all of those data points, throw them into a statistical program, run a multivariate regression analysis, controlling for nonlinearity and let the program spit out the equation for me. Um, later on, never heard that answer. And even during that conversation said, I like that answer. What kind of nonlinearity would you control for? And I'm like, you know, at that point, I don't know if it's quadratic. I don't know if it's, you know, or, or I forget which one it was. So, well, I thought it was quadratic versus the other one is, is leaving my mind right now. But, you know, I, I said, well, I'm not 100% sure, but he ultimately he kind of steered me and said, okay, Dimitri, which one do you think it is? I gave him an answer. I think it was quadratic. And then he imposedly said, are you sure? And at that point, you got to kind of double down. So if you said, oh, no, it's something else, oh, log normal. It was, it was either quadratic or log normal. So I kind of, you know, um, doubled down um, and I told him why it was. Later on, we became, good, you know, I, he became part of my network. I worked for him and I asked him about it. He's like, I didn't know the answer either. I just drew this random thing on the, on the piece of paper. But the fact of the matter is that one, you gave a, um, a unique exam, a unique answer that was more of my technical skills, but you kind of were able to back it up. And even though I challenged you and he was bluffing if it was a game of poker that we were playing and, and ultimately you know, I stuck by my uh, guns. Now it could have been, I was wrong. If I ran, you know, that statistical program and honestly, it's so easy to run these programs. I, uh, you know, in R or in, in items like that, I would run one for, quad, you know, adjusting for quadratic and another for log normal and see which one fits better. And then, you know, that's the answer, whichever one fits better, whichever one explains the buying information better. So, you know, at the end of the day, don't claim to know all the answers because if someone came in front of me and I've had this and they claim to know all the answers, forget about it. Forget about it. Until we get uh, microchips planted in our uh, brains, just guys, just you're human. You're going to make mistakes, just own up to it, and don't try to be Robocop or whatever the euphemisms are right now. But really, be humble and don't, don't think you know everything. And, and we're part of a team where no one knows everything. And if they claim to know everything, they're either delusional or they're lying, honestly. Thank you so much for that, Dimitri. Truly, that was honestly some great advice. And then while we're on the topic of advice, is there, if you had to give every student here one takeaway from this discussion today, what is that one piece of advice you want everyone to walk away with? Um, I can chime in here, Harleen. Um, I would definitely say, especially during this pandemic, um, it's a very unprecedented time for all of us. So I would use this pandemic as a springboard to tap into skills that you've never used before, right? So throughout these past six months, I've seen a lot of entrepreneurship that was birthed from being in this pandemic. So don't be afraid to try something new. Don't be afraid to start a new skill and, and also to take calculated risks. That's one of the biggest things at Bloomberg that I love is that we're able to, you know, think outside the box and think creatively because even with the challenges that we're facing right now, it could birth a lot of, um, of new opportunities for all of us. So if it's anything you take away is to don't be afraid and take calculated risks because you never know where that's going to take you. And I'll jump in very quickly to say, uh, use this op and echo the, um, you know, uh, Jamila's st statement about using this as an opportunity to expand your skill set. But even though, you know, you'll have to be, at least for me, my pitch is always to be a lifelong learner. Even though I have a CFA, which a lot of people strive for, and it's very difficult to get, I'm actually, I'm, I, I'm pursuing a CPA um, right now. So the advantage of this, um, oh, this, the fact of the matter is I'm a night owl. So I wake up a little bit later, I get my work done, I get my studying until two or three in the morning. Um, and you know, that's how I've been kind of taking advantage. Otherwise, I would have to go to sleep by midnight or 1 a.m. to wake up, you know, by 6, 7 a.m. going to the office. So I'm taking advantage. Um, CPA wasn't what was on my radar. I was thinking about it, but I kind of 
pushed it into full gear um, after I saw what was happening. And, and I saw, I'm not going to have this flexibility you know, in the future, so I might as well take advantage of it. One piece of advice I would give is to um, read more. And <laughs> I say that because when I was in college, uh, I didn't really read much. And I'm not talking like, you know, like your English literature classes from classes or anything, but, you know, read about things that you want to learn about because I've learned so much more about the financial markets and things that interest me about the financial markets in books that I've read recently. Uh, over the past few years than any class that I've taken at Baruch. And there's books about anything too. So, you know, some of the things I've, you know, read, read up on is technology or, or you know, automation, like whatever it is, read up on that. And you just learn so much out of a much smaller and condensed um, format. So highly recommend that. And I, I say that because I wish I started reading more books earlier. I think I started getting more into reading, you know, my last year of college, but you know, I started earlier. So if you if you haven't, um, highly recommend just pick up a book like, for example, Liar's Poker. If you're interested in learning about <laughs> financial markets and sales and trading specifically, I think it's a really fun and interesting way to learn about it. So that's just one example. Yeah, look, I I I'd dive in here and just say, one of the things that I tell students a lot um, on campus is that. You know, you want to try and find ways to be self-sufficient um, and proactive. And I say that because oftentimes, and I'm skipping past the interview here and going straight to the internship, students get to an internship and they think about it as a classroom. And so when you all get to your classroom on the first day, what's one of the first things your professor hands to you? Or in this case, I guess what is the, one of the first things they email to you is your syllabus, right? So you know exactly where you need to be, when, you know when home, you know when exams are, you know when you need to prep. And when you get to your internship, no one hands you a guide, right? No one says like, hey, like here's exactly what you need to do step by step for your internship. And sometimes interns freeze up. And so what I encourage you to do is try to find ways to demonstrate proactiveness, to be self-sufficient, to go out and find things on your own before asking the question. And there are ways to do that, right? Um, there are ways to even ask questions that make it seem like you've tried to do your homework before going out and asking the question like, hey, I thought about this this way, what's your view? Right? Or I've been digging into this one project and I have A, B, and C views, but I'd love to hear your perspective, right? And so I, I, I encourage you to think about how you can do that more frequently, especially during this time um, in, in, in this semester of, of school. And Jeffrey, if I can add one other thing from on, on everything you just mentioned, which is absolutely correct. I just wanted to let everyone know that there is no absolute answer. Unfortunately, first of all, you have to ask questions. So you, you, there is no extreme of, you can't ask questions or you ask too many. You have to find, you know, the, the happy medium. And also, uh, there's a concept called analysis paralysis where you keep trying to, to solve the question and answer the question yourself. Um, and you keep going and digging. And at some point, you have to realize, okay, there's time pressures, there's um, deadlines. So you have to, you have to find another happy medium between you know, between not knowing what you're talking about and analysis paralysis, because when you go up and, and you speak, for example, when any associate, senior associate, anyone, I even had, I even have directors and managing directors ask me for specific areas that I'm the expert in that, you know, which is my fastball, which is another kind of slang and consulting for my area of expertise, you know, ultimately, depending on how much time they had, there may have been a client conversation an hour ago where even um, then, you know, they, they needed an answer in two hours and they don't have the opportunity to do a lot of research to get the answer. Well, then that's where I have to be understanding and tell them the answer or, or you know, be understanding of the facts. But if the client conversation occurred two days ago and, and it's due in, in a day or two and they have the luxury and the ability to do some background research before coming to me, um, then I would ask, you know, not, it, it, you know, we're all people, but 
end of the day, just like they have a lot of things on their plate, I have a lot of things on my plate. So if I feel that they could have done some homework, not to the point where they're pulling an all-nighter to try to replicate something that I've been doing for years, I'm not asking for that, but I'm asking for you know some background um, research that they could have done, some research into the details of the matter. So I, I just want to say that it, it, it depends on you know what your approach. Don't take any um, what you call extreme approach. But as Jeffrey mentioned, the internship, the full-time role, there's very few guidebooks. And even if there is a guidebook, which I think Stephen can touch on from a reporting point of view, if he doesn't get that report out by noon, he's gonna he's gonna face some issues. So if there's some kind of technological issue that's that, that's stemming that's causing him. Not, and I don't want to speak for Stevens on Stevens' behalf, but if it's some kind of issue that's causing it to be delayed, you know, there's the patch that they can do in the next 20 minutes, you know, some manual work, or there's a strategic solution that they can answer and get done in a week. Well, they have a deadline of, of noon that day. So they are going to, uh, they're going to have to go with the manual approach while keeping in mind the strategic approach. So it all kind of depends. You kind of have to be willing to roll with um, get, get sleep, because if you're in a very, um, what you call a pressured environment where you have to be on the ball two minutes, uh, in two minutes increments, like I got a call actually from my client that I actually had to pause and I'll get to it afterwards. But, you know, um, get sleep. It, it, it's, honestly, I've told, and I've, and I've had this conversation a week ago, if, you, you know, seven, eight hours of sleep will be much more effective than if they pulled an all-nighter and try to, you know, get something could be a half an hour incremental benefit because then they're done for the whole day. I can't, you know, you know, they're not as effective. So just again, it, 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 it's a balancing act. Thank you so much for all these answers. And thank, I want to say thank you to all the panelists again for really providing insightful answers and advice to the questions asked today. And I'm sure our students that are here today have a lot more questions to ask you. At this time, we're going to remain on schedule and we're going to break out into breakout rooms. 